Yeah. Good afternoon. Okay, I'm ready. Yeah, uh, so the homework uh, submission, if you, uh, let's see, I, why did I say we want this at the uh, beginning of the uh, class? Oh, because we're going to discuss the uh, solution at the end of the, uh, uh, in the in discussion session, I think, is that right? Yeah, all right, so it's probably a good idea if you can just pass to, to this side of the, uh, the, the table and uh, um, Kevin will collect them, all right? Just pass on. Thank you. Okay. All right. The um, what did we discuss uh, in the last lecture last week? We uh, um, finished the section on charge sheet model of the IV characteristics of MOS transistor. And uh, there are two equations to that particular model. The first equation indicated is equation uh, 450 and 451. What it is is an uh, expression of ID as function of two surface potentials. The surface potential at the source, phi S0, and the surface potential at the drain, phi SL. Besides these two unknowns, the only other parameters that appear in this uh, ID expression are things like uh, uh, Cox, like mobility, W and L. All right? Other than that, all we needed is these two surface potentials. The second part of this um, chart sheet model is equation 452, is how to obtain phi S0 and phi SL for given VGB and VSB, or VGD and uh, VS, let's say VGB and VDB, that's right. So these are the, the, um, the uh, there are two equations that allow us to solve for phi S0 and phi SL. Unfortunately, these two equations cannot be solved analytically, so numerical iteration are usually used. Of course, you can also um, try to obtain some analytical approximate solutions for phi S0 and phi SL. But that's very difficult because these phi S0 and phi SL appear in the ID expression as in, in exponential terms, if you recall. Exponential phi uh, SL over KT, for example. Yeah? So you, you have to need to know these surface potential quite accurately. Now, if you combine this equation, if you somehow solve the phi S0 and phi SL as function of VG and VD and VS, of course, then you end up with the, this uh, relationship. It's ID as function of VGS, VDS, all right, as well as VSB. So if you want to be, to be, um, to be, uh, to be uh, exact about this, probably, I should remind you, it could also be a function of VS, right? Here we're using the body as a reference, so there's no need to put in this fourth uh, uh, voltage VB. Out of four voltages, one can always be chosen as a reference. So suppose we choose VB here, then we just write VG, VD, and VS. All right. Very often, of course, we chose uh, VS as a reference. In fact, why don't I force that thought a little bit? Let's use the VS as a reference. In that case, then we talk about VGS, VDS, and VBS, right? That's fine. Okay? All right. Okay. The other thing that this model sort of brought up is that, in general, we can and ought to consider two current components, the drift current and the diffusion current, all right? And uh, instead of reviewing what we actually did for the, uh, in the chart sheet model, why don't I just uh, give you sort of a, a simpler version to compare these drift current and diffusion current. Both of them, we're going to use this relationship. It's kind of approximate relationship just for th today's purpose. Q inversion is equal to C ox VG minus VT minus V, the channel potential V, right? You all know what that is about, right? So if we use that approximation, how would you write the drift current? You would say it's equal to W times C ox times VG minus VT minus V, 
right? That give you W Q inversion times the velocity. That's mobility dy dv dy. Okay. Any question about this drift current term? Okay, that's pretty straightforward. What about the diffusion current? We don't usually see the diffusion current in connection with MOSFET often. But if we wanted to write it down, actually, we can write it down this way if we use the same uh, expression for Q inversion. It will be W with times the diffusion constant D times DQ inversion DY. Is that right? So it's W. What is D? Use Einstein's relationship. It's mobility times KT over Q. Is that right? Finally, we are left with dq inversion dy. So we just differentiate this q inversion with respect to y. So what do we get? We get c ox, that's c ox here, right? Times dv dy. Is that right? Okay? And in fact, we even have a minus term. So if, if we really carry everything carefully, I even have a minus thing, term here for you. I, I'm not trying to be presumptuous. I don't usually follow these uh, the, this, the signs, but just so happens I notice it's a missing minus sign in case you ask. We can add here, of course. All right? Okay. Now, let's compare this uh, diffusion current and drift current. When is the diffusion current large or when is it negligible? Why don't you compare these two last equations, see if you can draw some conclusions. When you compare these two, it turns out the W is common, the C ox is common, the mobility is common, even the DVDY is common. So what do we have as, uh, uh, for comparison? Well, apparently, drift will dominate when this quantity, Vg minus Vt minus V, is much larger than Kt over Q. Is that right? Right? Of course, V does vary between source and drain. It's a little bit complicated. If we keep it simple, just say V is very small, VDS is small, and then it's really just Vg minus Vt should be much larger than Kt over Q. Now, that is why in strong inversion, we usually don't consider drift diffusion current. It's a good approximation, as you can see here, right? Whereas if we get into subthreshold, of course, then uh, Vg minus Vt not only uh, can be uh, the small, in fact, can even be negative, then the diffusion current will dominate. These are more, more rigorous if we look at the uh, chart sheet analysis, but we don't have to just by, by looking at this uh, simple uh, con con uh, analysis. We can already draw this conclusion that is drift current dominates in strong inversion and diffusion current dominates in subthreshold current. Questions? All right. So that's um, a review of what we did last time. All right, any question about the uh, um, chart sheet uh, um, IV model or IV characteristic in general? All right, if not, we'll follow the textbook's order. We could come to a, s a new section called the uh, VT control, the threshold voltage control, all right? Well, first let's look at uh, how to measure VT. You know, it may seem to be a simple problem, but it turns out it's not so simple. There are different ways of measuring VT and how to relate VT to theory. It's really complicated. And um, so let's just, just look at it. There are basically two ways of measuring VT. One is to use this relationship, the well-known relationship, that is ID equal to WC mu over L VG minus VT minus VD over 2 times VD. All right. So the first, we take the special case of VD very small, for example, 50 millivolt. Now we're talking about how to measure VT. So you can choose your VD, right? Suppose we choose 50 millivolt for VDS. OK? All right. And uh, then um, the, the first equation reduces to the present equation. That is, ID is proportional to VG minus VT. This VD over 2 is negligible because we're assuming VD is very small. Is that right? OK. So this suggests that if we make a plot of ID versus VG for a fixed VD, for example, 
with VDS at very small 50 millivolt, all right? Again, this is a question in reality. I'm not kidding. Is 50 millivolts small enough? Should we consider using even smaller um, uh, voltages? But now this is fine. You will see um, uh, there are other reasons why, why we actually don't make use of, um, of the data very close to VG equal to VT. So we usually only use the data somewhere around here. So we, 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 we uh, fix VDS at a small value, like 50 millivolt, plot ID versus VG. We end up with a curve like that, all right? Now, hopefully, we will find a curve that looks fairly straight. That's what we, we, we expect from the simple equation. And uh, then um, we will extrapolate a straight line to zero ID. And the extrapolation, the intercept, should be equal to VT. In other words, intercepts at VG equal to VT point, right? So this is how we measure VT, and you probably know about it, have heard about it. Well, just two points. One is that we have to use extrapolation, turns out, because the, 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 the ID data does not intercept the VG axis very cleanly. There's a tail. The tail, of course, you probably know is called subthreshold current. We'll talk about it later. So we have to extrapolate to the point of ID equal to zero, first of all. And secondly, in reality, the data really doesn't look like that. It really looks like this. And this has to do with the phenomena some people call mobility degradation. But the word degradation seems to sometimes um, um, give the implication of the instability with time, the change with time. So uh, uh, perhaps um, I will try not to use this term. But what it is is that mobility is known to decrease with increasing VG. We'll talk about this later in, in, in the class. As a result, because mobility decreases, ID then deviates from this linear relationship decrease. And of course, in this um, low voltage region, there is a subthreshold current. So in reality, it's very hard to say where you're going to make that um, uh, linear extrapolation. All right. So to be uh, to be specific, the uh, convention in industry is to extrapolate from the point on this curve of maximum slope. All right. You look for the point where the slope is maximum in this ID versus VG curve, and you extrapolate that, that curve. All right. Now, the slope of the ID versus VG plot is known as what? What's the slope of ID versus VG plot? In other words, what's DID DVG? That's called a GM, right? So this method sometimes is called maximum GM method. You know, that doesn't, it's not very uh, uh, descriptive uh, name, but, but that's what some people call this, right? What that means is you, 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 you take the IGD versus VG plot and uh, take the extrapolation at a point where GM is maximum. In other words, where the slope is maximum. OK, question. All right, very good. The question is, why um, do we talk about measuring v VT based on some current, such as IDVG measurement, versus some kind of capacitance measurement? It's a very simple reason. That is, current measurement is much easier to, do, to make than capacitance measurement. Capacitance measurement is subject to more complexities, such as the parasitic capacitance. Right, and the measurement uh, uh, accuracy is more complicated, and um, I think people have less confidence if, uh, you know, uh, three different students, maybe in three different laboratories, let's say, make a measurement of the capacitance of the same sample. Likely, we're going to get, you know, uh, significant difference, let's say. Whereas uh, IV measurements, you know, it's uh, expected that everyone probably will get. Uh, 
quite reproducible result. So basically, it's a, um, it's, it's a difficulty of the measurement, number one. And number two, there's no clear answer as to what is the correct way to define Vt. Now, you may go back to what we talked about in the, um, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, um, uh, you know, chapter three, the first few lectures, where we defined Vt as where the capacitance is equal to, to something corresponding to, let's say, uh, xd max, um, half of the xd max is depletion region, for example, right? You can do something like that. But the question is, it's a very arbitrary definition. What do we want this capacitance Vt for? What do we use it for? And when you ask that question, why do we want to know Vt, usually? Turns out, this is probably as good a definition as any. Because we usually need Vt because we want to be able to model IV. That's probably the number one reason. You know what I mean? If you have a practical reason as an engineer to know what Vt is, it's probably because you want to be able to describe IV. So if you want to describe IV, then the best way to, to measure the Vt is to go from IV, where it matches your, the equation you're going to use to, to, to model the IV. Do you see what we're talking about? All right. But those are excellent questions. So, so, so um, I think I, I probably gave you, I think the best answer of why we measure uh, the capacity of VT this way is to, to measure the IV this way. Because now I'm going to deviate from this and tell you why sometimes we don't measure VT this way. There are, there are complications that measuring VT this way is, um, is, is not uh, um, you know, always um, um, uh, preferable. And, uh, and for that reason, um, we really have to think hard, you know, what's the justification for measuring VT this way? But an answer I gave you probably is the best one. In fact, you know, one person answers this way. He says, we should uh, measure VT in whatever way SPICE model defines uh, requires VT. Because that eventually is what's going to be translated into the performance of the, uh, of the technology, into the circuit design, right? But that's maybe somewhat of a, a um, too much of a purist view, or perhaps even simplistic view, because there are other reasons we want to measure VT for process control, for um, engineering in the fab. Um, although the person arguing for the sort of uh, this uh, spice model centric view also have a point in that even the process engineer, device engineer should be aware. Eventually, everything they do get translated into performance of the company's products through the SPICE model. So whatever SPICE model, how a SPICE model defines VT, everyone better just adhere to it. But, but you can see the different sides of this uh, story, right? It's a complicated problem. It's complicated uh, because anytime you have more than one VT measure method, now what is the VT of this transistor? Now this is going to be, to be a, um, a problem. But for better or worse, usually a company would just focus on one of these methods. Sometimes they learn to, to tolerate the coexistence of one method. So I think it's best that uh, we know about all of them. All right, so if we use do this. Now, before I leave this method, let me just give you one um, question. And I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe you can do that as a uh, term project, term paper project. That is, can you derive expression? to describe the quantity that's obtained at this intercept. In other words, there's no reason to think at this intercept, 2 phi b is, I mean, uh, phi s equal to 2 phi b, which was the definition we used before, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Now, do you think you will be able to find a way to, uh, to uh, uh, derive expression for this intercept? If you can, I think that's actually quite a useful contribution. All right? You may be able to do something about that, and uh, that will be uh, something interesting to try. So what is the model for this intercept? Okay? It's not clear uh, what it is. Um, again, just uh, another it's a question for you to think about. All right? Now, suppose we say, ID is proportional to Q inversion, all right? Suppose we just use this relationship. ID is proportional to Q inversion. So what we're really plotting here is Q inversion versus VG. Can you tell that the, the definition, so, so, so where 
If that's the case, then where is the phi s equal to 2 phi b point? On this id versus vg curve. All right? Can you answer that question? And maybe uh, we can uh, think about this um, uh, in the discussion session if uh, you can think about during the break. All right? We'll come back to that. OK. What did, uh, that's the second method. The problem, one with the, another problem with this first method is that it's a, um, it's a, let's shall we say, a more complicated when VDS is not very small, when VDS is not small, at large VGS, okay? At large VDS, what is VT? How do we make that measurement? Now, you can try to argue, well, there are ways to still deal with this equation in the saturation region or something like that. But there's an, another way to uh, deal with the situation, which is much easier. There's a particular reason we want to measure VT at large VDS, because some of you may know, if you don't, we're going to discuss it later. There's an important topic that is the effect of VDS on VT. Particularly, we want to measure VT as function of VDS. We want to know, as VDS increases, how much does VT change? And when you put the question in, 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 in those words, um, then it becomes very um, useful to think about this particular plot. There's log ID versus VG. Log ID versus VG, all right? Log ID versus VG will show one curve for low VD and another curve for higher VD, another curve for higher VD. So as VD increases, here I drew this curve for three different VDs, we end up with three curves. The main difference among the three curves is a shift to the left. In other words, VT is decreasing with increasing VD. All right? and, and how much does VT decrease as VD increases determines how much this off-state leakage current will increase. Let's say, for example, uh, let's say v, VG is here. All right? Suppose this point is VG equal to 0. Then at low VD, the leakage current is very small at VG equal to 0. At high VD, leakage current becomes of large. This is because VT has decreased as a result of increasing VD. All right? So that's why we are interested in this question, how much does VT change with changing VD? And if this is what we're concerned about, it seems a very good way to measure VT really is just to choose a fixed ID. And wherever this ID versus VG curve reaches that fixed ID, we call that VT. You see that? Again, the simplicity is obvious of this method, all right? So the question becomes, how do we choose this fixed ID? All right, how do we choose this fixed ID? Now, for better or worse, the literature more or less has come down to this choice. It's about uh, oh, 0, uh, 0.1 microamp uh, per micron width. Okay. Now, sometimes um, um, some companies use slightly smaller current, such as uh, 10 microamp rather than um, um, uh, 10 nanoamp rather than uh, 100 nanoamp, all right? And, um, you know, one relatively obvious sort of um, way to reconcile this two seems to me would be this. That is, you choose this fixed ID such that the, the low VDS VT becomes equal to this low VDS VT. You see that? All right? Yes? So that seems to be a relatively straightforward way to reconcile these two and make them sort of seamless. But this is not the way um, uh, you know, uh, the industry has sort of uh, converged on using, just because so many papers use numbers like this, or 0 0.01 nanoamps, an arbitrary fixed number. So that's what, uh, um, what you usually see, what people do, all right? 
OK? OK. So as a result, this number of Vt at low Vd usually does not match the uh, Vt from the maximum GM method. OK? So usually there's about 0.1 volt difference. OK. Questions? Yes? Meaning, meaning, like, there's a certain sure. ID match. Sure. Yeah. So the question is, in choosing this ID, why don't we choose a definition such that ID is equal to, let's say, 1% or 1,000th of the ID set, right? Maybe then you have to define at what VD set. You say, well, VD set at the VCC, at VG equal to VCC, perhaps. But if you do that, then Vt, first of all, becomes a function of Vcc. Now, is that really the way we want it? You know, Vcc, after all, is not a, a device quantity, right? It's, a, it's something you, you choose for your circuit. Now, should, should that influence our, 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 our Vt value of the device? It's, it's not clear what's the best definition. That's a problem with this method. Yes? What's Vcc? VCC is the power supply voltage. And this actually is a, a leftover from the uh, bipolar circuit. C stands for collector. So I suppose I should use VDD. It's probably better, but you do see that used interchangeably. But if I remember, I call it a VDD. Uh, VDD is power supply voltage. OK? All right. That, all right. Good question. So this really is a problem, all right? Uh, again, related to this is can you then uh, um, derive expression for the VT obtained this way, you know, as a function of the ID you choose and uh, W and L, perhaps, yes? And if you can, could you actually figure out what ID you want to choose that such that it matches the, uh, the VT of the first method, right? Treat this as an analytical problem, as a uh, theoretical problem, and well, again, idea for term project paper, uh, term project uh, uh, idea. Yes, question. Uh, could you speak in the microphone, please? So uh, the log ID versus VG, that transistor is in the triode region still? Uh, you're talking about ID versus v this one? Yeah. Translate into triode region. Is that your question? <laughs> well, it certainly translates into the, the, uh, the uh, sub-threshold region or, or sort of the uh, the the uh, transition between subthreshold and the strong inversion because that's what VT is, right? So that we all agree. Triode. Let's clarify this uh, this terminology before we try to answer it. Now, probably not all of you know this terminology. ID versus a VD curve. I don't think I ever use this term. This part we all know. It's called the saturation region. Is that right? Yes? Now, what do we call this part? Now, you probably call this part linear region. That's very good, all right? That's very good. Now, what about this? Sort of, you know, what about this part? Or perhaps if I just drew the, the circle larger, all that. That's not that linear. So what do you call that? It's bigger circle. Well, there are two names for this. Some people continue to call this linear region. So when you see the term linear region, you know, you have to uh, allow the possibility that the person meant everywhere other than such region, all right? Some people reserve the linear region to this, this really portion where VD is very small, where things really are very linear. Now, in this uh, latter case, then how would he, what would he call this larger circle? Well, turns out there is a word for it. There's a name for it. It's called a triode region. One reason I think this term is not very popular now is because I think uh, most of you don't know what triode is. Well, it turns out this is a term from coming from the vacuum tube, all right? Now, it turns out that one type of vacuum tube that um, has a three uh, electrode called a triode have a set of IV curve that looks like that, okay? And, uh, and uh, th th the name for this region used to be called a pentode region, P E N. TODE, that's another type of vacuum tube that apparently, I assume, give you IV curve very much like that. All right, so it's very, uh, very much 
independent of VDS, and that is uh, called a, a pen code region. So, so his question is, are we talking about trial region in this curve here, ID versus VG curve? Are we talking about trial region? Well, what do you think? How would you answer that? Now that we are clear on what's meant by trial region. Well, you know, the, so the interpretation is that are we in saturation? Are we in trial? That's supposed that 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 has got to be the question to be answered. Are we in saturation or not? So in this region, if are we in saturation or not? Right. Let's not worry about the transition. How about if I moved ID even lower? Really, in the in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, um, uh, uh, substratial region, are we in saturation? Now what's the relationship? What's it for saturation? That's when VDS is larger than VG minus VT, right? Then we are in saturation, right? Then we will not be in the trial region, as you were asking. So how do you answer this question? Well, I guess I'll probably say, yeah, if we are measuring this at, fair, at some significant VDS, then VDS will be larger than VG minus VT, because kind of by definition, we're trying to look for the point where VG is equal to VT, right? So we choose this ID for that point. And, uh, so VDS will be larger than VG minus VT, and we'll be in the saturation region, so we're not in the trial region. Okay, so this is trial, but saturation, trial sometimes is called linear, all right? Other times linear is reserved to a subset of the trial region. Okay, all right. Thanks, other questions? All right, now let's move to a uh, next topic, um, um, 4.6.2, so how in practice is VT controlled, all right? So VT controlled, first of all, by the um, uh, doping concentration of the body, such as uh, the acceptor concentration. If this P-type body, it's, it's acceptor concentration. If it's N-type body, it's the uh, uh, do uh, donor con uh, concentration, all right? But it's a little bit more complicated than that. Let's, let, we'll go on. But basically, this is certainly the concept we should, we should um, uh, start with. That is, VT is strong function of uh, the doping concentration. If we plot this as a function of log N sub, the reason we want to plot log is we kind of like to start with a very low concentration, 10 to the 14, then 10 to the 15, 16, 17, 18, or something like that, right? If we do that, then, of course, it will show this manner. That is, uh, once you, uh, you come to 10 to the 17 or something, VT start increase very rapidly, and um, right? Next, it's also a function of oxide thickness. If the oxide is thicker, then VT is larger. For any doping concentration, the thicker oxide, the larger the threshold voltage, right? These facts should be memorized without referring to any equations. We should just know that uh, VT is larger when we dope the body more heavily, and it's, uh, it's, um, uh, VT is larger when the oxide is thicker, all right? Now, if you want to relate that to an equation, to a model, then this is the equation. We have seen this before. VT is equal to 5ms plus 25b. And if we have any fixed oxide charge, QF over C ox, is that right? It's okay? Now, if we want to be careful about this, I probably should uh, do a minus sign, right? Because we all, this is sh really should be minus sign, yes? And uh, plus the uh, depletion charge, depletion layer charge, divided by C ox. Is that right? Now, where does um, um, body doping come into this equation? Where does it come in? Which term? The main thing is this term, all right? It's this term, Na. It's true, it does affect the phi b somewhat, all right? But phi b is only a logarithmic function of the doping concentration. So this term is the main reason why Vt is a strong function of the doping concentration, all right? Now, where does the oxide thickness dependence come into this equation? Well, it comes into the equation through the C ox term, yes? All right. For a larger T ox, we have a smaller C ox. Smaller C ox making VT larger. Okay. So to 
remember this general behavior. Okay. Now, one interesting fact is worthwhile to remember. If we have an M plus poly M MOSFET, right? If we have M plus poly M MOSFET, right? Do you know what phi MS is for M plus poly M MOSFET, roughly speaking? You may remember that from perhaps uh, uh, what you did for the first homework set. Or, well, let's just draw a simple energy band diagram, all right? Phi MS really is the, 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 the flat band voltage, right? Yes, basically. So let's draw the flat band. Substrate has Fermi level here, right? That's substrate. And here's the gate. Has a Fermi level right here, right? So in this diagram, what is our phi ms for this flat band voltage? Is this quantity, right? Is that correct? And therefore, you know, would you like to give me a number? It's what? Zero point what volt? 0.9, doesn't matter, roughly, right? I'm just looking for a rough number. Now, next question. Is it positive or negative? The way I drew here, is this flat band voltage positive 0.9 volt, negative 0.9 volt? Negative, because the Fermi level on the gate side is higher. Higher meaning negative, right? Higher in energy band diagram meaning negative in the vo voltage, right? So it's minus 0 0.9 volt, right? So I put 9 down, down here. What is 2 phi b, roughly speaking? What is 2 phi b? 2 phi b really is, uh, you know, twice of this quantity, right? So give me a number. So how about we choose uh, 0 0.8 volt? Is that right? Now what's interesting is that if this term is negligible, which is usually is. You know, good MOS does not have uh, a lot of QN. And if doping is very light, such that this is negligible, all right? OK? That's very easy. If we don't deliberately dope the substrate, later we will see we actually implant a lot of uh, dopant into the substrate to give us a threshold voltage. If we don't do that, then this body doping is very light. This term can also be negligible, if that's the case. Then what do you expect Vt to be? What's that? For M plus, M plus poly. That's what the example we're looking at. What about minus 1 volt, right? Is it minus 0 0.1 volt? Is that right? Right. You know, maybe it's minus 0 0.2 volt, we don't know. So it's close to 0, slightly negative, meaning it's slightly um, um, depletion mode. That is, even with zero volt on the gate, we're already in, 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 in um, uh, inversion. You know what I mean? We call this type of device depletion device, right? Depletion mode. Okay. That is, v, it's on even at Vg equal to zero. On at uh, Vg equal to zero. You see? When Vt is minus 0 0.1 volt, then the device supposedly is slightly on at Vg equal to 0. So it's good to remember that uh, M plus poly MOS, which is the standard uh, 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 gate material for MOSFET, so let's just say standard MOSFET, if we don't dope the substrate, we end up with about 0 point, minus 0 0.1 volt of threshold voltage. This concept is uh, particularly useful because now we are dealing with very, very thin gate oxide. So C ox is very large, right? So even at 10 to the 16th dopen, this term is almost negligible. All right? You have to bring your device doping to 10 to the 17th or something before this, 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 this uh, uh, can pretty play a role. Otherwise, you're dealing with just about a zero threshold volt device, or maybe even slightly negative. The same conclusion analysis applies to the standard design P MOSFET. All right? So that's another thing I want you to remember, is that M plus poly is standard gate for M MOSFET, P plus poly is standard gate for P MOSFET. Not that we cannot do things that's non-standard, but this is the standard technology today. So in both cases, we get zero volt or slightly uh, uh, enhancement, uh, 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 slightly depletion mode device.
okay, question what we're talking about? All right. Now, this diagram just shows a non-standard uh, case, all right? Now, so suppose we have a P plus polysilicon P fat. When the doping is light, we have zero volt or slightly enhancement uh, uh, depletion type of device at light doping. What if we now use M plus poly as the gate material for the P channel transistor? I'll let you work out a sign, but the answer is that the threshold voltage will become minus 1.1 volt, meaning it's very high threshold voltage, too high threshold voltage, all right? I will not uh, talk about the implication of this uh, later, uh, perhaps in class, we'll have a chance to say a little bit more. But so these are the two standard the design of, um, of transistors. But once in a while, you may still see this uh, um, type of transistor in DRAM, for example. You may still see uh, M plus poly of P fat. You don't see P plus poly for N fat. Okay, you just don't see that. All right. Okay, so that's some uh, background uh, information, continuous review. Now, when we want to adjust the threshold voltage, therefore, what can we do? Well, we can either change the oxide thickness or we can change the doping concentration. Between these two, we cannot afford to change the oxide thickness because oxide thickness has such a strong impact on our transistor current, ID, ID set. And we usually want as large current as possible out of a transistor so that we can charge and discharge the circuit fast, all right? And therefore, we want to use the thinnest oxide, okay? Thinnest determined by maybe some reliability considerations or leakage current consideration. So gate oxide is not a, 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 a something that we can play with. And therefore, the only thing we can play with is the body doping concentration. And the way to change the body doping concentration is not to order wafer of a certain dopant, but rather we always order wafer with fairly light doping, and then implant dopant into the substrate to the level we want, right? That way we have the flexibility of changing the doping concentration, make it a little higher, make it lower, and also make them different for the N-type and P-type, so on and so forth, okay? So we always control the body doping concentration by ion implantation. Now, when we do ion implantation, then we have a choice of creating doping profiles that maybe peak near the surface, right? As shown here. Or we can choose a doping condition or implant and annealing condition. Such a doping profile is more or less flat, all right? such as showing this middle curve. Or we can do what's being done today, is we actually make the doping concentration higher in a subsurface region and leave, this, leave the doping concentration light in the, uh, in the surface layer. This is called a retrograde doping. Is that right? Okay. Retrograde does not necessarily mean it has to be flat all this much. It can start to come down. Well, that's fine. Okay. So these are the three styles. It's interesting that um, uh, when eye implantation was, was first used, it was ver used in this manner. The purpose was to try to increase the body doping concentration near the surface so that we get larger threshold voltage, all right? And later we see there are difficulties of, a, of, a, of a, uh, staying with such a light uh, uh, body doping concentration, so we started doping the body more heavily. And, and by the way, this is sometimes called a well doping profile, because the well doping, as the well doping profile gets uh, gets large, we um, end up having more or less the, a uniform doping concentration. And finally, now for short channel effect, and also for the reason where we we, we want uh, smaller VT in the circuits, right? We don't want 0.7 volt. We don't even want 0.5 volts anymore. We want 0 0.4, 0 0.3 volt. We don't want to dope the surface as heavily. We end up having this retrograde, right? The, uh, the f control of the short channel effect is really the reason for using retrograde. We'll get to that later on in the course. So these are the, um, the kind of doping, well doping profiles that you see, and retrograde is doping profile that's, uh, that's in use today. Okay. Yes. So for a single poly process, you're kind of stuck then with the P. 
That's exactly right. So uh, you know this uh, terminology called single poly process. That is some process for uh, cost consideration only has one type of gate material, that is M plus poly. It's for that reason we sometimes do see M plus poly used in, uh, as the gate material for P-channel transistor. That's exactly right. So that is the case for the single poly technology. For dual poly technology, then you will see these two type of transistors, all right? Then you have to do something to adjust the doping in the body to bring this back to where you want, such as what we're talking about here. All right? In that particular case, it's a slightly even unusual the type of dopant you implant is somewhat uh, surprising. So here, let's still talk about the, uh, the, uh, the, the standard case where implanting, say, boron into the N-type uh, uh, P-type substrate and implanting phosphorus or or even arsenic into the uh, N type of substrate. That's the way we can adjust threshold voltage, okay? All right. Now, in terms of the model's equations, we are all familiar with this first case of uniform. If we can uniformly create a uniformly higher NA, then of course VT is larger just because we have a larger NA. What if we create this case? a sort of spike of dopant near the surface. Um, let's call this, uh, simplify this, may put a, a delta function right at the surface, right? Make this uh, just a, a delta function dopant uh, high uh, at the surface, if we did that. Well, turns out an easy way to model that is to think all we are doing was introduce a sheet charge, a delta function charge. Think about it. All we're saying is that we have added now a sheet of um, acceptors near the surface. Acceptors are always ionized, right? Even at the, especially at the inversion case or VT case, because the acceptor level is below the Fermi level. Is that right? So any acceptor, any boron implant near the surface will be depleted, will be uh, ionized. Now, when a sheet of boron is ionized, it gives a sheet of positive charge. Is that right? Now, when you have a sheet charge, positive charge, what's the impact of the sheet charge on VT? Isn't it just like this? Very similar to our, uh, you know, uh, um, QT, the surface charge, fixed charge, QF term. QF is the fixed charge, right? So the effect of a delta function, the open profile is very much just like introducing a, a, a fixed charge. Is that right? So this is a very easy way to visualize what we're doing with this implantation. It's just putting this implantation dose, however number of percent meter square, right? Dose. If you, implant, if you implant shallow enough, you can model this at right the surface, then this is a very simple way to visualize it. Is that right? Okay. Now uh, the textbook uh, gave a model and will now review with you. It's more complicated. If you want to, 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 to uh, look at it, you can, but it's probably not necessary. Just know that such a thing is in the test book. It's fine. That is actually ex derived expression for VT as function of the dose and a function of the thickness of the dopant layer. All right? Okay? So we rarely use uh, this type of uh, equation to try to analyze the VT. Um, if we really want an accurate estimate of VT, we'll probably go to process simulation to first get the accurate um, um, profile of the, uh, of the dopant. We're not going to assume this way. And then from there, let the computer calculate the VT for us. All right. So this equation you know, is in that awkward middle range. It's uh, too complicated for for use um, uh, as uh, such as in comparison with just modeling the uh, implant charge as a sheet charge, right? That's easy. And not accurate not enough to, uh, uh, for, uh, for real engineering um, application, so it's not very uh, useful uh, a model. Instead, the engineer will go to TCAT tool for use process simulator such as Supreme and Predict to find accurate, very accurate profile of this dopant. And then use device simulator or 
if that if VT is all you want, you don't need it. But then the device simulation can uh, use this profile and uh, tell you the current and VT example. All right. So this together is called a TCAD tool. T for technology. You all know what what CAD means, of course, right? Computer aided design. In contrast, then the uh, other tools the designer, circuit designer use would be called ECAD, right? That those tools and those th that technology is called ECAD for electronic CAD, right? And that would be like spies or, uh, or uh, layout tools, uh, physical design tools. Those are called ECAD tools, okay? All right. Okay, let's just continue. Uh, well, in fact, I'm, I want to move one topic up here to this point. And uh, so look at 7.9, all right? 7.9. 7.9, we'll move to, uh, uh, to this point. Maybe uh, uh, Kevin can help me move that to just insert there. All right, so we're talking about the uh, VT model. We look at a uniform doping, a uh, surface doping. What about retrograde? Let's think about a VT of a retrograde uh, well uh, device, all right? Retrograde will look like this, all right? Okay. Now we're going to, again, simply model this way. That is, here is P plus, very heavily doped, and near the surface, it's just undoped. The dopant density is so small, we just neglect it. And the thickness that of this layer is called a D, all right? Is it okay? So let's see if we can work out expression for the VT. Actually, did, 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 did uh, we ask you to do this for the first homework problem? Kevin, no? This is not there. All right. So let's, let's do this uh, together. All right? So we're trying to write expression, derive expression for VT. All right? Doesn't matter what doping profile is, at the threshold, phi S is equal to 2 phi B. Do you agree? Right? Okay. Next. The surface at e uh, uh, electric field, electric field at surface, ES, electric field at surface would be equal to 2 phi B over D. Do you agree? Because 2 phi B is the band bending. Now, the electric field in this band, in this uh, depletion region, is uniform. Why? Because there's no no, uh, 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 no charge in this region, no significant charge. Is that right? What? Yes, question. Why did you call it depletion region? That's not, there's nothing there to be depleted out, is there? Suppose we have 10 to the 15 or even 10 to the 10s of dopant still can be depleted, okay. right? Okay. It's called a depletion because any time when both the uh, EC and EV are far from a Fermi level, we know we don't have any significant electrons to, to speak of. We don't have any significant hole to speak of. And that's a telltale sign. It's a depletion region, all right? So the emphasis is that we don't have electrons. We don't have holes, OK? Yeah. So, the, um, so that's why I drew this um, energy band diagram with a straight line. Do you appreciate why it's straight line now? It's just a constant electric field in this region, all right? Yeah. Yes? No? Now, if we have a, 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 a heavily doped conductor here, we have a certain boundary here. In between, suppose there's no charge, right? No donors, no acceptors. What will be the potential profile between these two points? It has to be a straight line, right? Because dE dx, which is proportional to charge density, is zero, right? by our approximation, right? So we emphasize that just by drawing the straight line to emphasize you understand what retrograde well is, right? OK? Don't draw it like the same way you would draw with a uniform doped well. There's nothing to, uh, uh, to indicate you're dealing with a, um, a, a retrograde well, right? OK. So given that you know this is the energy band diagram, then surface uh, field is equal to 2 phi b over d. You agree? Yes? 2 phi b is the voltage drop in this region. D is the length of this region. OK, next. What is the electric field in the oxide? It's just equal to epsilon silicon over epsilon oxide times 2 phi b over D. 
Yes? Next, what is the voltage in the, across the oxide? Voltage across oxide is T ox times E ox, therefore it's equal to epsilon silicon 2 phi B over C ox device B. Yes? Next, what is VT? VT is the VG at that threshold condition. So VG is always equal to flat band voltage plus phi S, which is 2 phi B, right? We're going to do it. Oh, well, anyway, always plus phi S plus V ox. All right? So therefore, it's equal to two phi VFB plus 2 phi B, that's the phi S, plus V ox. V ox is not this. Right? Yes? Not even the, uh, 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 there's no, no uh, uh, square root sign. So it's actually a simpler uh, equation to model this retrograde profile. Is that correct? Now here, I kind of replace that D with W max. You know, that because D is kind of a non-conventional notation. So maybe you still prefer to think about W uh, max, WD max. And then you just have to separately remember that WD max is equal to just the slightly dope the thickness determined by that. Is that right? Right? That's the thickness of depletion layer. Okay? All right. Now, we're actually ready at this point to answer this question of why retrograde well is good. Why is it preferred? Let's compare this with a uniform doping device, uniformly doped device. Vt is equal to Vfb plus 2 phi b plus the square root term over C ox, right? This is just review what we already know. It's OK? All right. Next, I'm going to rewrite it so that the last term is written differently. The first two terms, no change. Vfb plus 2 phi b. The last term, I'm going to write it in such a way that Wd max appears. Now, we all know what Wd max is for a uniformly doped uh, case. For uniformly doped case, Wd max, you all know, you probably know better than I do, is 2 epsilon s, 2 phi b, divided by q and a. Is that right? Is that right? So we can f force the denominator to have this W D max term, and that took care of a lot of these two phi Bs and uh, you know uh, doping concentration things like that. All right. What remains? What, what what the difference we just put into the numerator, and this is what we get. We get four epsilon silicon times phi B. You may want to sort of confirm that this and these are equal. All right. I have a question here, please. Uh, here, the WD max for the uniform doping device is different from the. Uh, of course, these two WD max is different. So right? how 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 could you compare this? I'm going to compare next. I have not done any comparison yet. Oh, all right. Okay. I'll, okay. First, let let me just uh, confirm that you all accept that this is correct. Is that right? All right. Now we're ready to compare. Turns out, there is a there's a problem in designing short channel transistor with low VT. In order to design short channel transistor, and I cannot tell you why, I'll just tell you a fact, we have to make WD vex very small. Needs to be small, OK? Need small WD max. This is for short channel effect consideration. So we want WD max to be small. In other words, we want to dope the substrate very heavily. But when we do that, we end up with very large VT. Okay? So device engineers have known for a while that it's very difficult to design a low threshold voltage transistor for short channel transistor design. It's very difficult to do that. On the other hand, the, the circuit designers are demanding sh smaller, smaller, low, lower, lower threshold voltage because of the power consumption consideration where using smaller, smaller power supply voltage, VDD. And in order to, to accommodate smaller power supply voltage, we're using lower and lower VT, all right? And uh, that involves, of course, uh, already interesting uh, uh, constraints such as uh, leakage current. But in addition, one problem that device designer faces is that how do you design a transistor with low VT namely 
like doping concentration, and still can suppress it, the, uh, the, the, the bad short channel problems. So now, if you go back to this, this, uh, this uh, 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 case with the um, delta doping, you can see. What happens is that when you use delta doping, the last term is smaller by a factor of 2. All right? Pardon me? I, I shouldn't call it delta doping. Let me call this, um, call this uh, um, what do I should I call this? Retrograde is a good one. But unfortunately, unfortunately, yeah, it's a confusion. Thank you for catching it. Um, you see, I think when, when I use the term delta doping, I probably reminded you of this. But here, I never used the term delta doping. I never put this, those two terms uh, together as a phrase. I said delta uh, function charge profile or something. It is true that uh, one style of creating a uh, a uh, yeah, retrograde well is to create a doping like this. And this is known in the literature as delta doping. <laughs> All right? This is called a delta doped well, it's a delta, a delta doped well profile. Okay? So, um, uh, so that's why I, I call this delta doping uh, to, to refer to this a retrograde well. And uh, one of the paper that I will ask you to read later actually I believe has this uh, term in the uh, in the title of the paper, delta dope well, it refers to a retrograde type of um, uh, doping. All right, so this uh, retrograde well ideally can reduce the VT this term by by a factor of two. If reduce last term by a factor of two, what does it mean about VT? What can you say about VT? If I tell you the retrograde well profile can reduce Vt by a factor of 2 for given Wd max, in other words, for given minimum channel length. All right, I'm making the simple now. For given minimum channel lengths, we can get half of the Vt by using retrograde well compared to, to, uh, del uh, to uniform doped well. Why did I say I can reduce Vt by half? Well, in fact, I only reduce this one term by half, right? What about the other two terms? What about the other two terms? Kyot, please. They add to roughly zero, right? That's why I ask you to remember those things. So it's useful to remember uh, some of these facts, right? So immediately you know Vt really is determined by the last term, right? This is determined by the last term, OK? When you consider this term is negative, actually, in principle, you can reduce by more than a factor of two. All right. Of course, you we will never get ideal retrograde either. So, the um, factor of two is probably a pretty good number to keep in mind. Any question about the retrograde doping? Okay, back to um, uh, slide seven five. Okay, now we look at uh, a new section called the body effect, or so body bias effect. I think you all remember what body effect is. Body effect refers to the fact that Vt is a function of the body bias, Vsb or Vvs, all right, Vsb. Vt is function of Vsb. That fact is body effect. Yes? Um, you said that the, there is a factor of 2 that's uh, introduced because of the retrograde well, but that's assuming that the Wd max is the same, right? So is I didn't, s okay, let me rephrase this. Let me rephrase this, all right, okay. Uh, I know this is confusing because I haven't uh, told you the relationship between WD max and the uh, channel length. But let's suppose I tell you, suppose I want a certain L mean, all right? If L mean is, is given, if I need to design transverse L mean, this will require the, maximum allowable W max, okay? Maximum allowable, allowable WD max, all right? Take the statement as given, all right? Right? Once this is now given, now I have two ways of meeting this requirement, WD max. One is I choose a retrograde doping such that D is equal to this number. 
true is I chose the doping concentration in the uniform doped well, such that WD max is equal to that number. In these two cases, we will find the retrograde doping device has only half of VT, and that's a big win. All right? Okay? All right. Question? Uh, use the microphone, please. I, I have a feeling that this VT for retrograde well device is actually higher than what it should be because the picture on the right is at the um, VG equal to zero, right? Picture on the right here? Yeah. No. This is for the case at VG equal to VT. In other words, I'm trying to draw it at least at for phi S equal to 2 phi B. We don't know what it, what the, how it should look like at VG equal to zero if we don't specify the work function for the gate material. Yes, but then if you, if you draw the system for the flat band voltage, and then if you um, bring the system together at equilibrium, I think the, um, the intrinsic region is, is already depleted or You inverted. see, this is why I um, drew it this way. I'll, I'll answer the question slightly differently. Maybe we'll save a, a detail in the, uh, in the discussion session. So thank you. It's a very good question. The good question is the definition of the flat band. Okay, what does that really mean? All right. Now, of course, you can define flat band in, in some ways, probably uh, in very reasonable ways. But once you define flat band, you have to go Again, let me tell you what, what is the pro what's causing this problem. The problem is that they have two different doping concentration here. When they do two different concentration, how do you define flat band voltage? What is the phi m? What is the phi s substrate work function? Do you use the work function of the heavily doped side? Do you use the work function of the lightly doped side? Is that right? Yes? Now, you can struggle with that. After you finish struggle with that, define it, conclude how you want to define it, then you have a new question. That is, in this VT expression, is that flat band voltage still consistent with this relationship that is using the definition you have chosen for V hat B? Is, is the VT still equal to V hat B plus phi S plus Q ox? All right. So the question of V hat B is really a problematic. All right. So you may want to work through that. But what I'm suggesting to you is that if you think this way, it's actually the simplest. You won't have to bother with it. Okay? In this case, I'm implying the VFB is between the gate and so-called P plus substrate, rather than intrinsic substrate. You see, Hugh mainly has a problem of intrinsic. As long as this is not intrinsic, as this is 10 to the 17th or 10 to the 18th, it actually doesn't make any difference, even though we call it P plus, almost like P. I think Hugh is mainly concerned if this is intrinsic, then of course its Fermi level is very different from where it would be for 10 to the 17th or 10 to the 18th doping, all right? But as long as you pick 10 to the 17th, 18th, then this VFB and that VFB will be the same. Basically, no difference, right? And if there's no difference, then you will find it the way I did it is exactly that. You see, I'm drawing it from this heavily doped side, 10 to 17 or 18. Is that right? And then this 2 phi b is to be right. Clearly, this has to bend down by about this 0.8 volt, right? OK? OK? And then finally, it's this, this quantity here. OK? All right. The good question, um, remind me, we can talk more about this in the discussion session, all right? Mainly about this term or so. When we have two different doping concentration, what should we use for 2 phi b? Right? That's certainly a good question. All right. OK, let me finish the slides we prepared for this lecture here. So you remember what body effect is. If you look at the equation, the body effect comes from this term. Last lecture, we have said that any time we have reverse bias between the uh, source and the body, there will be two Fermi levels. When there are two Fermi levels, turns out it's Fermi level from the source that determines the electron concentration. And therefore, the band bending at threshold is not just equal to 2 phi b, but equal to 2 phi b plus Vsb. Right? It's something that you probably have to think more about in coming to yourself. And again, we can talk about that uh, at the uh, discussion session after the uh, break, right? So those are all your opportunities to ask questions discussion session. So 
As a result of this, clearly VT will be larger when we have a body bias. What's also clear is that it's not a linear function. VT is not a linear function VSB. It's in the square root term. So if we make a plot of VT as function of VSB, what we're going to get is we're going to get this, uh, um, this, uh, uh, this sort of a sublinear curve. All right? So that's the curve probably sometimes you see. So it's good to keep in mind. All right? A few other details here I want to point out. This effect, this body effect, is undesirable. We don't like that. Okay? We don't like VT to be a uh, function of VSB. We like everything about our transistor as stable as possible. We don't want to change with temperature. We don't want to change with body bias. We just don't want to change. Okay? So we want VT to be as stable as possible. Now, how can we, can, how can we minimize this uh, body effect? Well, if you look at this equation, you will see one way to minimize the, 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 the body effect is to make NA small. Is that right? Yes? So for example, here I drew you two curves. One is for NA1. One is for NA2, which is smaller than NA1. If NA2 is smaller than NA1, we see VT is less sensitive than NA, the, the NA1 case. Right? The problem is that by reducing the uh, doping concentration, we have also dropped the VT. Without a bias, right? Right? Suppose this is really what we want. This is the 0 0.5, 0 0.4 volt. This is really what we want. By using a lighter doping, we then don't have the VT we want. Wouldn't that be a problem? Well, this is why people used to do these sheet doping right at the surface. Remember this term where that came from? That is modeling a very shallow implant of the boron as a sheet chart. If you do that, you can bring the VT back up to here, but NA will still be light. You see that? OK? So this is the lure for using the uh, 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 shallow sheet doping to adjust the threshold voltage. Now, of course, the um, uh, retrograde doping is the opposite of this. So we're probably getting a worse body effect. Is that right? And the fact is, it is true. We're sacrificing that, all right, unfortunately. Uh, if we're looking at the retrograde doping, and you have seen this before, let me just point, OK, let's see. We're going to cross this one out. Um, so. I'm not going to look at that charge. This sheet you have seen before, just remind you, this is a, a doping profile of uh, Intel's uh, 0.18 micron technology. This is called retrograde doping. A transistor like this, we expect the VT to be more or less a linear function of VSB. Right? You can model that as a linear function of VSB better than model that as a square root term, square root function. Following what I'm saying? All right. The behavior is actually easier. But in a way, you see, this is the problem with, with retrograde, right? With retrograde, now we are more sensitive. The VT is more sensitive to VSB. You see what I'm saying? OK? All right. OK. I really urge you to understand sensitive to, to VSB versus not so sensitive to VSB by looking at this diagram. When we say we don't want VT to be sensitive to VSB, all we are saying is that we want this capacitor to be small. We want WD max to be large. All right? But we just pointed out earlier, the beauty about retrograde uh, uh, well is that we made WD max very small. So we made this, we made this capacitance large. If the capacitance is large, of course, the surface potential will be very sensitive to VB. Therefore, VT is a stronger function of VB. Is that right? OK. All right. So I just read something. W depletion in the case of retrograde doping uh, profile does not vary with VSB. Now, as a result, VT is a function of uh, VT0 plus alpha VSB, yeah? 
a linear function of the of the uh, of the body doping of the um, body bias. Now, retrograde doping is popular because it reduces off-state leakage, and we'll see that later in the course. Okay. Let's see what else. I guess we have the equation here again. Vt is equal to Vt0 plus alpha Vsb. Is that right? And alpha is really just the ratio of those two capacitors I drew in the previous slide. Okay. Is body effect a good thing? No, it's a bad thing. We don't like that. How can we reduce it? There's basically only one thing we can do, two things we can do. We can either reduce Wd max and or we can what? Do we want to reduce Tox or do we want to, uh, to uh, increase Tox? Well, you know, this is two opposite, right? If a, if, a, uh, if a large WD max is good, of course, small Tox is good. Is that right? Right? Because small Tox also helps us to give the control to the gate and therefore make the effect of the VB relatively small. All right? So there are two things we can do, is we can use a large WD max, or we can use small TOX. Now between these two, which is more desirable? Small TOX is good anyway. We want small TOX for, for a large current. Large XD max does have a, uh, a trade-off. It's going to hurt us in short channel effect. Let's bet that. Okay, so this is the end of the lecture. All right, let's take a uh, five, uh, six minutes break. I notice you usually don't take uh, as long break as ten minutes. Then we'll come back and uh, uh, for the uh, discussion session. Okay.